So I guess we'll get started. This is a, a combination of a, the mechanical engineering department seminar and the turbology minor seminar. Um, so this semester, uh, the speaker, uh, Michael Michalik, has been, uh, he, he's been visiting this spring, whole spring semester, uh, helping with research and sharing some of his work. And then you know, basically we're collaborating on some uh, topics here. Um, and hopefully it's been worth his time. It's been kind of a, we had some projects in mind, but things have been delayed due to the supply chain issues and all that. But um, anyway, he, uh, what part of the plan was he was gonna present some of his work that he's doing. Um, I'm gonna just uh, give you a little bit of his background. I received his MS degree in mechanical training from Brno, how do you pronounce it? Brno. Okay, yeah. Brno University of Technology in the Czech Republic in 2019. Uh, he's currently working on his PhD. I think he's pretty close to finishing. He's a member of the Tribology Research Group at the Institute of Machine and Industrial Design and in the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering. His main research areas are hydrostatic lubrication and machine design. Uh, I think that's, that's enough for now. So um, he's going to talk about his work, which I think it should be of interest to a lot of people. During this presentation, I'd like to tell you something about the, myself, my research, about our institute I come from. It's a brand new university of technology. Uh, then I will briefly tell you about my uh, other activities I do at my faculty, and it will go directly to the bearing types especially the hydrostatic bearings uh, we are here for, and this will be the core of the presentation. Uh, I'm originally from Slovakia, but for my university studies, I moved to Brno, uh, which lies in the uh, eastern part of the uh, Czech Republic as the second largest city right after Prague. I'm pretty sure you know Prague also from movies. And it's a nice uh, uh, historical city as well. But my university was uh, founded in uh, 1899. So it is, uh, it's uh, uh, history. So far, we have faculties like uh, chemistry, electrical engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, IT, business, but also art. Uh, overall, all the faculties have approximately 18,000 students uh, and uh, approximately 3,000 employees. Now let's get to uh, my faculty. Okay, it's not my computer. <laughs> uh, it's Faculty of Mechanical Engineering, which is second largest faculty from the university. Uh, we have uh, the faculty divided into institute. We have 13 institutes and uh, we have approximately 4,000 students uh, in all degrees. About the research at the uh, Institute of uh, Machine and Industrial Design, we can divide it into four departments. So we have the biggest one is tribology, uh, where we deal with uh, biotribology, rail transportation, and uh, advanced lubrication. Then there is uh, uh, next department of condition monitoring, uh, my colleagues deal with uh, non-destructive testing, fibroacoustics, but also they develop uh, magnetological semi-active dampers. The second biggest department of our institute is department of uh, reverse engineering and uh, technologies, and uh, colleagues that deal with uh, 3D printing of plastics, uh, metals, but also concrete. And a big part of the research is also optical digitalization and reverse engineering. And the last uh, uh, department of our institute is uh, Institute of uh, Industrial Design, a uh, department of industrial design, sorry, uh, and colleagues that are with uh, uh, product design, product redevelopment with uh, focus on its functionalities. Now let's focus uh, on the tribology group uh, I'm part of. Uh, we can divide the research activities into six uh, key areas, but mostly uh, it's not strictly divided that uh, I am in one of these areas, but the areas actually 
uh, overlap and we collaborate on various research problems. Uh, basically, we can divide it into advanced experiments. Uh, where mainly, we develop and construct uh, um, experimental rigs. And for example, my colleagues are developing optical tribometers for elastrohydrodynamics uh, testing also for other faculties, for example, in Japan. Then we have lubrication, where basically uh, deal with all the spectrums of uh, lubrication regimes. So that's like the more general group. Then we have rail transportation group, where my colleagues deal with uh, uh, rail uh, to uh, wheel friction, friction modifiers, and improvement of safety. Uh, another one is lubrication systems, which is uh, very closely related to my topic of the hydrostatic bearings. And there are two big groups uh, that belong to biotribology and colleagues that deal with soft tissues and joint replacements. Also friction testing, material combinations and uh, improvement of the materials. My PhD topic is uh, uh, directly related with uh, hydrostatic bearings. Uh, more specifically, it's uh, large-scale hydrostatic bearings. And uh, I chose this topic because I wanted to uh, work in the research, but also I wanted to work with the industry. And this was a good compromise for me to gain knowledge in both of these areas. Uh, my other activities, uh, mostly covered in my master studies were elastro hydrodynamics with electrosensitive fluids, uh, so the so-called electro-rheological fluids. And basically we tried to modify the friction and film thickness uh, of ionic liquids using electric field. And we uh, also published some results in friction in 2020. Besides that, uh, I'm also supervising bachelor thesis and student projects. And for example, we work on developing of air compressed air powered cars, uh, mechanisms, uh, also some numerical simulations and optimization. Uh, speaking about the compressed uh, air powered cars, uh, I'm a member of uh, Pnobi Resic Team Bruno from 2017. We developed a uh, couple of cars so far. And uh, let me show just briefly uh, if this works. So just briefly demonstrate that it's actually working and uh, it's it's functioning. So those were basically my uh, my yeah my uh, activities uh, related to research, or, but mainly on the faculty. And now let's get back to the bearing. So firstly, uh, let us. I'm pretty sure you know what is the function of bearings, but just briefly, uh, let's talk about this function. So bearings are to uh, support relative posi position of two components, uh, to transmit the load to the frame, and also to uh, allow mutual uh, movement of two parts, either is sliding or, or rolling. So we can divide the bearings into uh, three main groups according to the direction of loading, which can be radial or journal, axial or thrust and combined. In the further uh, division, we can talk about two big groups. Um, there is a third group, which is uh, related to magnetic field. And let's just uh, briefly uh, put it aside and focus on rolling and sliding bearings. So we can divide those two groups by the contacts. So the rolling bearings work on non-conformal contacts where uh, higher loads and mainly the lubrication regime is the astrohydrodynamic. 
The hydrostatic bearings uh, belong to the conformal. Uh, it's maybe not seen here, but uh, to the conformal so type of contact. And we can divide those to uh, boundary lubrication and full film lubricated bearings. And in this uh, group, uh, hydrodynamic bearings and also hydrostatic bearings. And just briefly uh, highlights to one of the key advantages of hydrostatic bearings is that their friction is even smaller than in case of ball bearings. So that is uh, just to highlight one of the major advantage of such bearings. Let's talk about the principle of working. So we have uh, hydrostatic bearings and there are two key parts that uh, they function in, uh, or why they function. We can divide them to hydraulic circuit, which is supplying pressurized air to the bearing. So we are two uh, main parts of the bearing. And now the hydraulic uh, fluid or any other medium is supplied to, uh, to the pad. And here it's uh, uh, pushing away or separating the counterpart from the pad. So there is a thick film form, which is uh, approximately one uh, to 100 micrometers or usually. Uh, the, one of the big highlights of hydrostatic bearing is that they can work also at zero speed. So in comparison to hydrodynamic bearings, they don't need uh, certain speeds to create enough lift force to separate the surfaces. Uh, about the lubricant, uh, mostly used uh, hydraulic fluids because of the hydraulic circuit, uh, which works well with, uh, with this kind of oils. And the grades are, I'm not sure you use here ISO VG grades, but it will be some kind of equivalent, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but it's most used 32 to 68 according to the environment. So that's the, one of the key parameters uh, of the design and calculation is uh, dynamic viscosity. And we'll be talking about this uh, further. Uh, but also hydrostatic bearings work with other fluids. So we can use uh, water, we can use non-Newtonian fluids, but also air. And uh, in this uh, case, we call them aerostatic bearings. Uh, but this is, uh, there is one uh, uh, thing we should know. In this case, we have uh, non-compressible fluids. And in case of aerostatic uh, uh, bearings, it's a bit different. Are those sometimes just called air bearings? Air bearings, yeah. Yeah, so you see them in like rheometers quite frequently, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's take a look at the calculation of hydrostatic bearings. Uh, one uh, point we can start off is designing uh, the area. So according to the load, we need to uh, lift or we need to bear. Uh, and according to the pressure we uh, are able to supply with a hydraulic circuit, we can determine the lifting area of the bearing. Basically, the recess area is the area or the recess itself is to lift off the two parts. And then the film, the, the fluid film is formed on the land uh, area. The calculation is based on Avesto's equations and some uh, uh, simplification and derivations uh, leads to uh, analytical, analytical solutions, which are derived for simple geometry. So we, if we have uh, circular bearings or rectangular bearings, we can actually use the derived solution. Uh, but in case of uh, much complex geometries, and if we have more receipts, then we have the so-called multi receive bearings is way more complicated and there we need experimental or some other approach. Uh, the calculation parameters are mainly load. Uh, in case of machining centers, it's stiffness but also in case of the large bearings, it can be error compensation and film thickness. Uh, now just briefly uh, talk about the parameters we need for calculation in hydrostatic bearings. 
uh, we have. If we want to calculate what film thickness we can achieve, we can use uh, or we need the basically geometry, uh, dynamic viscosity, uh, supplied flow, and the load we need to know what is acting on the bearing. So those are the key parameters. Uh, the calculation can be generalized for other cases. So if we have uh, multi resist bearings or more complex geometry, uh, for example, four resist bearings, uh, we can use approach that was uh, presented uh, long, long ago in 1957 or 58 by Loeb. And they uh, experimentally obtained performance curves. And from those curves, we can get uh, optimal design for minimum bumping power uh, while we achieve enough performance for the bearing. Now we uh, use in this case the so-called performance coefficients and uh, this approach can be used to design uh, such bearing. Now let's uh, move to the other part of uh, the hydrostatic bearings, which is a uh, hydraulic circuit which is uh, necessary to supply the pressurized uh, lubricant to the bearing for proper function. Uh, in this case, we can distinguish uh, two main uh, groups, which is uh, single pump bearing, which is uh, mainly used for large bearings. Uh, and we divide the float for flow from the pump to all the pads and all the receipts. Uh, the other way is a uh, single pump for each of the receipts. Uh, there is the so-called constant flow, but this is much more complex in case of large scale bearings and it's not uh, very frequently used. And it is implemented mainly in small bearings and in special uh, occasions or applications. Um, the hydraulic circuit consists of uh, all the necessary parts to uh, secure uh, the flow for the bearing, a stable flow for the bearing. And there we have uh, flow meters, uh, pressure uh, sensors to see the condition of the hydraulic circuit. Uh, there are some uh, safety elements such as check valve and uh, relief valve. And we have one safety measure in this case of hydrostatic bearings uh, where hydraulic uh, accumulator can be used and this accumulator can supply uh, the pressurized fluids the bearing for um, necessarily short period until it stops for this can happen for example in case of blackout or in case of failure of the pump and then we have the flow regulation elements. Uh, we call them restrictors in this case. And we can take a look uh, at the, their function. Basically, we use the restrictors in multi uh, pad uh, bearings where we have a single, uh, single pump. So we need to distribute the flow from one pump to all the, all the bearings. Uh, we can use the restrictors or throttle valves to uh, evenly supply the bearing. So when we speak about the restrictors, we can divide them to two main categories. We have fixed geometry restrictors, for example, orifice plates or capillary tubes. And there is the, another group, which are uh, variable geometry restrictors, and those can be throttle valves, uh, elastic tubes, uh, proportional uh, valves, and other types. Basically, uh, we use them in hydrostatic bearings uh, for stability. And as you can see, in, in case of misalignment, they play a pretty huge role here. So as you can see, those are experimental data. And in case we have a well-aligned bearing, which is the case A, we actually it doesn't matter if the valves are working or not. So on the graph on the x-axis, we have a maximum throttling or 
fully open restricted. But in case of misalignment, what is the case B, we see that they play pretty much role because we can observe uh, loss of uh, average pressure in all the receipts. And this means that the fluid film is not bearing the load uh, all the load, so there might be some solid, solid contact, and this is really what we don't want in case of hydrostatic bearings, because some damage of the surfaces can occur. Now let's uh, take a look at uh, hydrostatic bearing operation modes. So we start with a non-working state where the pump is switched off. And as we switch off the pump, which is uh, the case B, the pressure starts to build up. And once the pressure achieves the level that is able to separate the two surfaces, it's uh, stabilized on the normal working pressure. And now if we increase the load, the pressure increases and the film thickness are smaller and it's in the opposite case, when we uh, lower the load, uh, we observe uh, reduced pressure and increased film thickness. So the bearing basically wants to get into equilibrium and acts how the load is acting. And when we switch off the pump, the pressure basically falls down and it depends on the accumulator or on the hydraulic circuit, uh, how quickly does this happen? Okay, okay. Now let's, uh, we've had the division of bearings in general. Now let's speak about the division of hydrostatic bearings. So we can also divide them according to low direction. So we can have radial or journal hydrostatic bearings, axial or thrust bearings, combined bearings, which are uh, frequently used in machining centers. Uh, then we can have a special cases, uh, which are com of combined, but they are called spherical, which uh, can be used in spherical hinges and conical, uh, which can uh, carry axial and radial load uh, according to the angle they are designed in. And the other it's division- do that too, based upon the angle, right? Like the, the spherical can do that as well, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, in case of the, the shape, we can talk about one resist bearing, uh, multi resist bearing, and multi pad bearings. So we can have also one special category, which is multi pad, multi resist bearings, but the things become more complicated afterwards. The advantages of hydrostatic bearings, as uh, I tried to highlight throughout the presentation, and one of the main uh, advantages is the complete separation of zero speed. So in contrast to hydrodynamic bearings, uh, there is, oh. yeah. it's okay. okay. Uh, there is, uh, they can be used also to move, uh, a, large structures at a low speed. Uh, they have very low friction because there is uh, full separation of the surfaces and there is uh, just the fluid friction and almost nowhere if there is proper use of the bearings. Uh, since there is the relatively thick lubricating film, they have a pretty decent uh, damping ability and huge uh, load capacity and stiffness, but this uh, this uh, depends on the hydro, hydraulic circuit. So uh, yeah, and the reasons uh, why they are used, or one of the reasons why they are used in uh, high precision applications uh, and the machining centers, uh, they have very precise motion. There is no solid solid contact and therefore there is no stick slip effect that can occur. And uh, one of the, Big things here is that they can be built on large uh, areas. So when you imagine a space telescope, okay, telescope that it has actually 20 meters diameter, it's uh, mainly built on hydrostatic bearings. We'll take, a, we'll take a look at that. But imagine if you 
need it's uh, enough precision to bear this big structure with rolling bearings or other type of bearings it might be a huge challenge uh, however uh, hydrostatic bearings also come with certain disadvantages so we uh, mostly speak about the high initial and service costs because we need to design the bearing itself also do a hydraulic circuit and also we have uh, we need more space also for the hydraulic circuit so this uh, can be a certain disadvantage for some applications uh, for proper function it's it uh, requires uh, the continuous supply so this might be a problem for some cases and as other types of bearing they are also sensitive to manufacturing and assembly errors. Uh, in case of uh, high speed uh, applications, uh, the friction increases. So this is the reason why they are combined with hydrodynamic bearings and uh, the friction is uh, basically in high speed. They are working, the hybrid bearings are working in the hydrodynamic mode and in low speeds uh, they work in hydrostatic modes when we need to stop the bearing or to uh, get it into the motion. Uh, as I uh, was indicating before, uh, the one of the uh, applications the hydrostatic bearings are used for uh, telescopes and antennas and we can see example of uh, giant Magellan telescope which is being developed and it's built on hydrostatic bearings. Uh, the other uh, applications uh, can be also heavy machining centers uh, because of the high precision and uh, the stiffness, uh, heavy turntables, uh, hybrid bearings for energetics and hydroenergetics. So for the to cover the spectrum of low and high speeds, and also a stage turntables or heavy hinges. So where we need to carry heavy load and we need to lower the friction as much as possible, we can try uh, to use hydrostatic bearings. And speaking about the large bearings, uh, let's take a look at the ELT or extremely large telescope, which is supposed to have uh, 50 meters in, in diameter and it's it's uh, designed uh, to be built on hydrostatic bearings with overall flow 720 liters per minute and 80 bars so it's a huge amount of uh, lubricant. Uh, the hydrostatic bearings were introduced uh, by Girard in 1852 and since then a long time passed but many developments were achieved in the field of hydrostatic lubrication. Uh, one of the two key highlights can be uh, Reynolds and Ravy which uh, contributed, group contributed to the calculation but then we had Rowe and uh, later Bassani and Picigallo who wrote a comprehensive book on hydrostatic bearings. And this book covers all the, uh, briefly let's say it's a methodology on how to design such bearings uh, based on uh, the research until that time. And uh, later uh, still the research and the trend uh, of interest for hydro uh, hydrostatic bearings is still increasing. And this might be the reason why they are implemented in the large structures for telescopes, antennas, and to use the later improvements in the modern machines. Uh, basically, the research uh, we published. Uh, a review last year uh, that was focusing on the design of large scale bear hydrostatic bearings and we can divide the uh, ongoing research in three main areas so one of them is safety where we or the researchers focus on how to avoid collision uh, on materials how to minimize the maintenance and how to improve the assembly precision 
the second big group uh, researchers are focusing on is uh, bearing economy. Uh, since there is the hydraulic circuit necessary, there is a huge uh, electric consumption uh, depending on the size of the bearing. So the researchers are focusing on shape optimization of the bearing, as we, we, we've been talking about the bed, recess, and all the shapes. Uh, also, they're focusing on energy cost reduction, because uh, as we will talk later, it's a lot of money saved in case of optimization. But also, uh, there are some, uh, there is effort to replace the rolling or sliding of bearings where they don't act very well with hydrostatic bearings to reduce friction and minimize the driving force. And uh, the third big group is control, where researchers are focusing on online diagnostics of the bearings, on maintenance prediction, which is a pretty uh, huge thing uh, right now but also feedback control in case of uh, variable load or in case of some minor misalignment that can occur. Uh, we've been uh, conducting research or doing research in this area. And now let's talk about uh, our research in those three groups I highlighted. So, uh, Firstly, uh, we designed uh, the so-called two pad bearings. It's easy because it consists of two pads and uh, it's supposed to be for research for large misalignment. So we have two parts. One is the experimental rig itself with loading and uh, all necessary components. And the second group is the hydraulic circuit. So we need to supply the hydraulic fluids into the bearing. What's the size of this, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, it's uh, about one and a half meter. Really? Yeah. Wow. There it is. So, yeah, there it is in, uh, in the laboratory. It, it's maybe around one meter to one and a half overall with the, with the motor. Uh, so it consists of the two parts. We can see the hydraulic circuit in the back, which was designed and uh, provided to us by our industrial partner, by Shrexot. And this is the part we designed uh, the bearing itself. Uh, so we can see, uh, we can use two types of uh, support. We can, uh, or we've been doing research on the support types. So if we can use uh, basically been asking questions if we can use compliance support for such bearings or how does it behave. But overall, uh, the bearing is, uh, is fitted with uh, sensors that uh, we need to compare uh, the measured data with the prediction. So basically we can measure film thickness directly, the total, total supply flow, uh, the, temperature, which we can calculate uh, dynamic viscosity and uh, the load, we uh, use the four sensors or load cells. And uh, yeah, so basically we can compare the measured data with the predictions. Uh, speaking about the sensors, we can use them also uh, to uh, determine if they, or if the information about pressure can be used to align the bearings. So basically we've been trying to have misaligned two bearings and tried to level it using uh, the pressure information in each uh, receipt. So basically the uh, prepositions, if the pressure is even, the film thickness is even, uh, seems to be true. Uh, one uh, big part of the research on this uh, bearing was uh, on large misalignment. So we were comparing uh, rigid support to compliant support. Uh, the basic idea was uh, the compliant support can accommodate to the shape of slider 
uh, when there is misalignment and create even pressure and film thickness distribution. So there will be no contact as it could occur in case of uh, rigid support. Uh, basically, this idea was proven and we can see that the compliance support can uh, accommodate to the slider and uh, in comparison to, to rigid support, doesn't change the film thickness very much. So the results were published in uh, Precision Engineering. So you want to take a look at the research in more detail, but basically the idea seems to be working. Uh, we need to highlight the one disadvantage that the compliance support is not uh, to be used for high stiffness applications because the compliance support uh, decreases the overall stiffness. So not for manufacturing applications or high precision applications. The, now let's move to the second uh, big group that's the bearing economy. Uh, here we try to reduce the pressure loss uh, in certain elements of the bearings and hydraulic circuits uh, and also to replace some all the kinds of bearings or other types of bearings with hydrostatic bearings to minimize the driving force. Uh, if we take a look at the two main contributors of the losses in hydrostatic bearings, it's uh, the fluid friction and the bumping uh, power loss. Basically the fluid friction, as you can see, is, uh, is very small, um, it's around, Five, uh, 500 newtons in case of bearing that is loaded by 400 kilonewtons. So uh, it's kind of negligible. Uh, but the main uh, contributor here is the energy we need to supply the bearing. So if we take a look uh, at, a, at an example for the ELT, as we've been talking about previously, the yearly uh, cost of operation for daily operation, 24 hours, it's uh, around 115,000 uh, just spent on the electricity we need to supply the pressurized fluid. And now, uh, as the previous research indicates and our preliminary uh, results indicate as well, we can optimize uh, using the shape optimization, we can save up to 20% uh, of the energy. So uh, basically it's a great deal of money if we talk about just one telescope operating for a year. Uh, speaking about the optimization, uh, as we uh, had the example of the experimental data uh, from low from 1958, we can use to optimize the bearing uh, proportions using one parameter. So we can have uh, the optimal, let's say optimal uh, shape of the bearing for multi-resist bearing. Now what we try to do is to implement multi-parameter optimization. So this is what I say that our results indicate much more uh, reduction of the losses. Uh, and for this purpose, we try to implement the computational fluid dynamics. And using the CFD, we can also investigate um, any shape we want. And we also get the information about the flow, the character of flow inside, where it's not possible using sensors. So uh, basically now we are in a, in a stage where we try to calibrate the CFD model, because uh, the thing is when you have a numerical model, you need to fit it on experimental data. And then basically you can calibrate it and use for other shapes. So this was uh, for the economics and uh, the last part of research uh, we work on at our institute is focused on bearing control. And here we uh, developed and uh, designed another bearing which is a bit longer uh, than the previous one. It's called three pad because it has three pads. So uh, as simple as it is. And this one is uh, to investigate small misalignment effects, uh, variable load 
and uh, feedback. So on these bearings, we want to design the feedback control in certain scenarios which can occur in real operation. And uh, this is supposed to be for the high precision application. So normal compliance support, but the, the high precision. And uh, the next steps in the research are focused on another bearing, which we are building right now. It has two meters in diameter. So we are trying to increase it <laughs> with the all next bearings uh, developed. And this is uh, this bearing or this experimental device is called four pads because it has four pads as simply as it is. And uh, it's supposed to be uh, to investigate combined effects. So here we uh, want to investigate uh, high speed or relatively high speed for hydrostatic bearings with uh, flow, uh, small misalignment, but also we can investigate the compliance support during rotation, how it behaves, and we will implement the feedback control here. So basically those are the efforts we try to do in this field of research. And our next steps will be focused on further research in all those three areas, uh, also on sliding surface modification. So in case the bump uh, stops working and the collision uh, occurs, actually what we don't want, but it can occur, how uh, can the modification of the surfaces, for example, coatings or so help to reduce the, the damage and about the economy, we'll further continue on the simulations and also try to implement uh, not only CRT, but also uh, fluid structure interaction because the pressure can cause deformation of the counterbodies and this can influence the film thickness as well. And the last part uh, is uh, the effort is conducted on or aimed at control and adaptive feedback control. So uh, from my side, this is all. If uh, in any occasion you can uh, visit us in Brno, I'll be happy to host you and to show you our institute. And now is the time for any questions you have. Great talk. Let's uh, look at the chat too. If you have any questions online, Right into the chat. Any questions here? Oh yeah. First, Michael, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure to watch. Um, I actually got kind of nostalgic on some of the systems that I've actually worked on in my past, believe it or not. Um, I was wondering, can we go back to kind of near the beginning, like slide 15-ish? Oh, sure. Because you were talking about the orifices and yeah. all that kind of stuff. You might need to uh, repeat the question when you answer it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It online. absolutely. So, so you essentially have some type of throttling system, whether it be an orifice or like a needle valve or something yeah. like that. I'm imagining that these are pretty far away from the actual bearing itself. Is that correct? Yeah. Because I would imagine that those would cause turbulence to the flow, which is something you want to avoid. Yeah, but we have piping before them and after them, so they are kind of isolated. Yeah, because don't you, have, or don't you have to be like 10 times away from uh, or something yeah. along those lines? Something like that. Okay. Um, thank you. That's why I was curious. The next slide, you were, you, were, you showed kind of the ABK. So, so you can, is that how you essentially tell whether you've actually achieved liftoff? Is you just look at, you're just looking at the pressure? Just yeah, exactly. Uh, basically you can make the calculations, mm -hmm. what pressure you expect approximately. And you take a look at uh, average pressure and when it's stabilized, you have normal operation. Okay. Cool. Are you measuring film thickness? Uh, yeah, we can measure film thickness. And how do you do that? Uh, we use uh, proximity sensors, okay. uh, but the contact sensors, as we uh, experience, are not the best solution. So now we switch to contactless and they are way better, high precision and better measuring. 
So, you know, instantly, you know, you, you bring up the, the con of high cost or at least high setup. I, I'm sure at some point, I mean, you know, obviously at for the people um, on the on the call, since they can't see my hands, you know, a bearing this size, you know, a physical bearing will be cheaper, but there has to be, I would imagine some crossover where, you know, at 50 meters, I find it hard to believe that if you had a 50, you know, a, a, you know, a radial bearing that, or no, I guess it would be the thrust bearing for the sat, for the, for, that there's no way that that's cheaper than the system, or do you, or do you believe that there's a crossover where the, the hydrostatic system would be cheaper than a, a traditional? Um... Well, uh, speaking about some discussions we've had with our Marshall Access company, I will not tell you exactly some things because I can, but uh, there is certain size when hydrostatic bearings uh, appear to be more suitable because of the maintenance, the rolling bearings they use and the rollers. Uh, actually, I uh, wasn't to believe, but they are suffering heavy damage. Yeah. Even though sure. they, they are not made from cheap materials, but they suffer really hard damage yeah. and the precision is uh, decreasing with the size. So we can say that at certain points, hydrostatic bearings become better also from the point of cost. cost. Yeah. I think they have a, Last I heard, they had a shortage. It's hard to supply all the large ball bearing, pulling out bearings. Uh, there's a large backlog for large pulling out bearings as well. And speaking about, for example, rolling bearings of big size, the precision is also falling down. So then the EHD is hardly to achieve, maybe impossible in the big application. I think someone wrote something in the chat. Can you read it? <laughs> Maybe read it so that. Yeah, this is a brilliant question. Kyle Castellano asked, uh, what type of manufacturing tolerances? I will read it to you so we'll know. Uh, tolerances you maintain when manufacturing your bearings and how can these effects uh, affect the efficiency? Uh, basically, when we designed the first device, we this was a hard question to, to answer. Also, for us, without, uh, uh, let's say, much experience, how it will behave. We uh, The assumption was basically we expected to have uh, 100 micrometer, micrometer film thickness. And so we needed to have at least uh, 10 times higher precision. Uh, but basically, it's better to have uh, even higher precision. However, this comes to be a big challenge in case of the large scale bearings, because to achieve uh, such precision, it's uh, costly, but maybe it's not even possible. So uh, this is one of the, re the main uh, areas we try to focus on right now after the large misalignment. So basically, simply put it, uh, if we have film thickness of uh, 100 microns, uh, we were trying to have the, the pad sliding surface around one micrometer or around precision. Any questions? Feel free to ask if you have any questions. There's another message. I can see the number up there. <laughs> How much longer are you here for, Michael? Sorry? How much longer are you here for? Uh, it will be like a month or so. Then I will go to STLE conference. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this will be maybe the end of my stay here. So with your different um, bearing designs, how did you like determine what um, amount of pads you were going to use? For what you're looking for? This is a brilliant question. It, it really is. Uh, basically, it depends uh, about the diameter. And the thing is, uh, we need to also think about the deformations of the counterbalance. So imagine if we had a 20 meter bearing with four pads, then we would have maybe large deformations in between. So in this case, I cannot tell you exact number, but uh, the higher, the better for the precision, but 
the higher is also more complicated for the elements of hydraulic circuit and the measurement uh, elements we have. Yeah. So if you want an example, I feel that there are around uh, maybe 20 paths in the telescope structure, but I, I'm not really sure right now about it. So I'm just speaking what is need to be, uh, what we need to think about when we will design such pairing. Because the deformation is a big deal for the film thickness and how it will behave. So if we have large deformations, uh, then it will try to uh, come to uh, equilibrium and then we will have a strong uh, unsteady behavior. Is it, I guess? I think so. Okay. All right. Thank you for your questions. Yeah, great talk. Um, so thank you for those who attended online.